Yellowstone. Beth Dutton. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor, continuing my analysis of the major characters from Yellowstone. Remember, as always, that in this classification, because we're dealing with characters that have been created for television, they're subject to the requirements of character arcs, plot development, and story evolution, which means that some behaviours may not necessarily fit precisely with the classifications, and that ought to be taken into account. Also be advised that there may be potential spoilers ahead. And finally, to ensure that the level of work that has been placed into these analyses reaches a suitably large audience, it'll be appreciated if you shared the links to these various videos in forums where Yellowstone is discussed, the characters for Yellowstone are written about so that fans of the show, who may not be aware of my work, are able to gain greater insight into the characters that they watch regularly. Thank you in advance for doing so. Bethany Dutton, known as Beth, is the second youngest child and only daughter to ranch owners John Dutton and Evelyn Dutton. She holds a professional profile in banking. Beth was born on July the 18th, 1984, into the ranching family in Yellowstone, Montana. Her mother died when she was, an only, ch when she was only a child. This occurred on March the 30th, 1997. Evelyn went out on a birthday trail ride through the roaming pastures with both Beth and Casey. Beth not being a confident rider, spooked her horse. Losing control, she spun out into her mother's own mare, causing Evelyn to fall and be crushed under the animal's body. Casey offered to get help as he was a strong rider, yet Evelyn dismissed him, sending Beth as the accident was her own doing. <laughs> Beth, frantic, rode off to the ranch to get her father. When Casey and Evelyn's horses came back to the ranch and accompanied John sensed trouble, bolting off to find his family. Beth, being bucked from her horse, was still deep in the pasture, trying to reach the ranch with a broken arm. The fact that her mother chose her as the less competent rider to go and fetch the father, pointing out that she was the one that had effectively caused the accident, and therefore was in effect being punished for that, is demonstrative of the upbringing that Beth had from her mother. More about that in due course. Right from the beginning, Beth took a likening to Rip, the orphan boy that moved onto their ranch in the 1990s. They were drawn to one another. She's also alluded to being attracted to women on multiple occasions. Cassidy Reed, Victoria Jenkins, and admitted to a short interlude with a lawyer's girlfriend. Therefore, she shows some sexual fluidity, which is representative of a lack of boundary recognition. When her father made her see that it was unlikely that Rip would ever propose to her, she took matters into her own hands. She asked her father's consent for the marriage and proposed to Rip when he came home after a bad day at work. She gave him a ring and offered him her hand, saying, The only thing I ask is you outlive me, so I never have to live another day without you. He calmly replied, I can try and do that. That was enough for him to demonstrate that he was under control and they decided that they would get married. Even though they had been engaged for a while, they got married fairly impulsively, which, of course, is one of the set behaviours of Beth. But she'd set her mind to it and forced a priest of the Catholic Church named McGregor to participate as the marriage officiant. Despite the fact that she didn't know him, that he had other things to do, she in effect kidnapped the priest and brought him to the ranch house to undertake the ceremony, demonstrating a sense of entitlement and an absence of emotional empathy for the priest, as he may well have had other matters to deal with. Beth might be summed up as a hot mess, a churning ball of fury, which never takes any prisoners. She's always putting people down with an insult or a sassy comment. She's unafraid of physical violence, both in terms of receiving it and administering it. She comes across as an unstoppable force of nature. 
It's hardly surprising that she turned into the person that she is when one looks at her parents, particularly her mother. She was not helped when, as a young girl, sat in a bathtub, she was told by her mother that men would now start to regard her differently, and that all of the boys that she had once out-wrestled and outrun would start to look at her in a different light, one of trying to make her feel inferior. Her mother tells her, but you're not. She's warned that after being repeatedly treated as being weaker because she's a woman, she'll believe it, and therefore... In order to provide an antidote to this, her mother has to be hard upon her. She states that she has to turn her into the man most men will never be, and that she is sorry she has to do it, but it was the best gift that she had received from her mother, and now she has to give it to Beth. With that guidance... It's little wonder that Beth turned out the way that she has. It's quite clear that her mother was absent emotional empathy, that she would treat Beth in a very hard manner in order to turn her into a preconceived notion of what she should be. That rather than learn from the treatment that she received from her own mother, Beth's mother simply repeated those behaviours towards Beth. Thus, it's highly likely that her own mother was a narcissist, meaning that the genetic predisposition could well have been passed on to Beth and she was subjected to a lack of control environment on a repeated basis as a consequence of this tough love received from her mother. Beth regularly insults people and looks to cut them down with her comments, all part of the need to control people. Some examples of this include an interaction with city boy Ted. After sizing him up in a bar... Beth puts him in his place. You're hunting. That's why you're sitting in a bar instead of standing in a river, Beth tells Ted before he asks, Who the hell are you to judge me? I ain't judging you, buddy. I'm hunting too. Just not hunting you, she says, belittling him. What's wrong with me? wonders Ted. To which Beth replies, You look like a real soft fuck, Ted. All you city boys do. She's talking to a complete stranger, insulting him, showing no boundary recognition, an absence of emotional empathy, and the fact that there's no facade generated here. What you see with Beth is what you get. On another occasion, when the bartender tells her that a Mr Jenkins has paid for her drinks, a kind gesture, she responds by saying, I wouldn't let that cocksucker pay for my funeral. Dismissive, haughty, arrogant. When her brother tells her cancer is suicide from the inside out, that's what you are, Beth, she responds immediately to nullify that threat to control while smoking a cigarette, saying, Wow, that's really deep, Jamie. You must be watching TED Talks on YouTube. Beth is arrogant, dismissive, and regards everybody else as beneath her. She rages at Jamie repeatedly, argues with her father, spars with Rip, To some extent, she gives Monica a pass. Not because she's kind and cares about her, but simply she regards Monica as too weak and not really worth the sport to fight with. It is the case that Beth repeatedly must draw attention to herself. On one occasion, there's a wolf howl breaking the silence at the ranch. Hearing the strange noises, Rip comes down to the barn and finds Beth howling at the night sky before collapsing into the dirt. In 35 years, she says, I've never been alone on this ranch. Rip looks confused as to what the howling has to do with all of this. Beth then suggests they could take off all their clothes and run naked through the field while nobody else is home to see them. Rip declines, but offers to keep watch while Beth does, using his usual way of being able to handle her without provoking her further. This, of course, is her seeking attention by talking about running around naked, introducing sex into the conversation, something she does regularly, more about that in due course, and, of course, behaving in a way of making a noise so that Rip's attention is drawn to her. She can't just sit and enjoy the night sky. She needs to provoke a reaction from someone. On another occasion, Beth strips naked and sits drinking champagne in a bathtub outside in order to generate a response, to create a stir. In another instance, she sat waiting in her father's bedroom whilst he emerges from the shower. She remains silent as he dresses, and then eventually comments about thanks for the anatomy show, Dad. 
She could have alerted him earlier to her presence, but she shows no boundary recognition by sitting in his bedroom, going there uninvited, and then observing him as he's completely unaware that he's being watched naked by his daughter. The issue of motherhood is a difficult one for Beth as a consequence of the fact that when she had an abortion, she also had a hysterectomy, and that she blames Jamie for removing her ability to have children. This, of course, is a huge threat to her need for control, and any reminder of motherhood similarly awakens that threat. On one occasion, she's striding through the barn on a mission to speak to Walker. She's distracted when Carter, the young boy that she brought to the ranch, calls out, Morning, Mama. Beth replies, not thinking, Hey, baby, and then stops. She then tells Carter he can't call her that because it's not true. He's visibly hurt by the rejection, but she doesn't care. He says, but you've been acting like a mum to me, so he thought she could be one. She corrects him. I've been acting like your friend, which is what I am. You lost your mother, kid. You don't get another. I lost mine. Same goes for me. The coldness of Beth and the absence of her emotional empathy is evident there. That because she suffered, others have to suffer. That is her default setting. Beth never finishes a meal at the dining room table due to her long-standing hatred of it. But, in one instance, she taunts John Dutton by informing Rip and Carter about fruits that are good for the prostate and that there is a holistic doctor that specialises in tantric healing and she talks about the erogenous zones of the body. John Dutton finally takes the bait and accuses Beth of getting her revenge at the dinner table. How is me trying to prevent you from getting prostate cancer revenge? She responds. Carter's oblivious to what the revenge is meant to be. Rip then asks, Beth, you're not going to do this at breakfast, are you? Beth, looking to belittle her father, and also to torment Carter and Rip, gives up her prostate health lesson and storms out. She often flounces, either throwing a grenade towards the person that she's talking to, telling them that they're sacked, insulting them before walking away. Beth and Jamie have had many disagreements. She hates him because she regards him as the reason why she can't have children. She repeatedly tells him that he's not part of the family. She repeatedly tells him that her father is her father and not his. On one occasion, he's summoned to pick up a drunk Beth from the Deerfield Club. They taunt one another in the car until it escalates to punches and slaps. Beth reminds Jamie the reason he's so soft is because he's never lost. While he may have physically lost Evelyn and Lee, Beth is adamant it's not the same as the pain that she went through. Of course, the typical victimhood mentality of a narcissist perhaps being evident there, as she is the one that suffers more. Her car's better than your car. Her pain is greater than your pain. Beth says, I'll show you the difference, and pulls a gun from the glove compartment and points at her own head. The fury is visible in her eyes as she explains, you've got to watch them to lose them. Jamie taunts her, thinking she won't pull the trigger, but the provocation causes her to pull the trigger. He, of course, as I explained in parts passing, has little emotional empathy and therefore tells her to do it. She pulls the trigger. A shot rings out as Jamie slams on the brakes, the shot having missed Beth's head. Once again, she demonstrates an impulsiveness, a callous disregard and recklessness, all in the pursuit of of getting control over the person that she's with and getting attention from them. An environmental activist, Summer, is bailed by John Dutton. At breakfast time, Beth walks into the kitchen to find Summer there, her having stayed the night and slept with John Dutton. Beth instantly perceives Summer as a threat, and therefore, rather than ask her who she is or be polite to her, goes into full attack mode, grabbing a kitchen knife, while a terrified Summer presumes Beth is John's angry wife and arms herself with a milk bottle. Summer is saved when John enters the kitchen, takes one look at the standoff and sighs. He attempts to introduce the women, but Beth then assumes that Summer is a hooker, not even a good one, she adds, and the two circle each other like sharks while trading insults. After disarming both women, John explains exactly how Summer got there. Naturally, Beth isn't prepared to let it slide just yet, because of the fact that she's jealous of her... Of, of her father she would never want to share him with anybody 
The three of them have an awkward breakfast, and Beth manages to get a few more verbal jabs in about Summer's diet and medical beliefs, showing a lack of tolerance for differences. After Summer informs Beth she should get a new doctor, Beth snaps, you should get tested for chlamydia, you fucking hippie. And in another instance, Beth is talking to Rip, and then, the next day, Two armed men enter Beth's office at Schwarz and Mayer. She manages to send a quick text to Rip, seeking help, before the men begin their assault. It's brutal, and most people would be terrified, but Beth refuses to give her attackers the satisfaction of seeing her scared, because in fact, she is actually fearless. She manages to stab one of her attackers in the chest, and the other in the leg with a letter opener, before the two men beat her up, along with her assistant Jason. They want to see you scared, don't give them the satisfaction, she says, moments before one of the men shoots Jason dead. This ignites fury for Beth, clearly threatening her need for control, and she taunts her attackers further. You want me to cry, huh? Cry and scream and try to get away? Then Rip appears, killing both men. In that whole scene, as she's being beaten, and possibly is going to be raped, she simply eggs them on in order to try and make them impotent of their power, recognising that such individuals may well thrive because she knows that she thrives on people's reactions. She recognises that they want her to be scared because it urges them on, it gives them a degree of satisfaction, and she refuses to do that. In season five, Beth assaults a woman in a bar who's flirting with her husband, Rip, Rather than just ignore the woman, because Rip's not interested in her, or tell her to go away, she hits the woman with a bottle, which then starts a bar brawl. It results in her arrest for aggravated assault. Thereafter, Jamie ensures that she avoids the more serious charge, and in the aftermath, whilst they're in the car together, Beth learns that Jamie has a secret son by seeing a child seat. This, of course, is a threat to her control, because she cannot have children, something she blames Jamie for, and therefore she says... I'm going to take him from you. I'm going to rob him. I'm going to rob you of your fatherhood, Jamie. These comments and threats not only show no emotional empathy for Jamie, but more crucially, demonstrate that she has no emotional empathy for this child whatsoever. She's simply using the child as an object in her war with her brother, in her desire to hurt her brother. She's no consideration at all for how the child would be affected by being taken from his father. And this demonstrates her callousness, her pursuit of only what matters for her, her sadistic nature. Beth Dutton is on a near-permanent war setting. Every meal she attends results in her provoking somebody and often storming away from the table. She repeatedly attacks her brother Jamie, turning up uninvited at his office and home lack of boundary recognition, sense of entitlement, where she will launch into another verbal tirade, often physically attacking him. She's attended business meetings where she insults the other attendees, showing no courtesy or politeness. In one, she flung a drink into the lap of one of the business attendees. She hurls insults around regularly, threatens to destroy people's companies. She exhibits considerable jealousy over her father, and his relationship with Summer results in Beth name-calling her and then physically fighting with her on the lawn outside the ranch. Even when doing something which is on the face of it potentially noble, such as sticking up for Monica when Monica is wrongly accused of shoplifting and is subjected to an illegal and humiliating search by the police, she goes too far in her humiliation of the shop owner. She rescues Monica, but then tells Monica to get dressed so she can watch the fun. She then goes and locks the door, and then engages in insulting the shop owner making reference to her giving hand jobs at school, bringing up the past, insulting her for having a boob job, smashing up sections of her shop, and then humiliating her by making her strip so she has to put on an outfit and noting that she's wearing Spanx. Beth has no emotional regulation skills. She regularly erupts. Even her own father at one point states, impulse control, get some, before a conversation with her. She has a pathological need to be in control and to be the centre of attention. Witness her naked stroll with the champagne bottle to the bathtub, and how, when she is taken to a beautiful meadow by Rip when they're out riding, he wants to sit and enjoy the view. 
But that means that his attention is focused elsewhere, i.e. it is not focused upon him, upon her rather. Accordingly, whilst he's trying to enjoy the view, she straddles him as a preparation to have sex. Rip protests, saying he wants to look at the view, but she orders that he looks at her instead because it offends her need for control. Beth is unable to communicate people communicate with people unless she has to utilize some form of seduction. The example I've just given you, whereby she communicates with Rip in relation to looking at her while she's wanting to have sex with him. She's hypersexualized. We see regularly that she wants to have sex with Rip first thing in the morning, that wakes him up in the night to have sex. She is unable to have a conversation without mentioning balls or insulting people by calling them sluts, for instance. And most of her clothing that she wears invariably highlights her cleavage. She engages in alcohol misuse. She's regularly drinking, often gets drunk. One suspects she drives under the influence as well. All of this behaviour is interesting because it's clear that she's uncomfortable in situations in which she isn't the centre of attention. Her interaction with others is often characterised by inappropriate sexually seductive or provocative behaviour. She consistently uses her physical appearance to draw attention to herself. She shows self dramatization exaggerated expressions of emotion and theatricality. She considers relationships to be more intimate than they actually are. She often regards people as fancying her, the way that she talks to men in bards, for instance. And much of her behaviour actually fits with histrionic personality disorder. But having stated that, as you know from my work, that I regard that borderline personality disorder and histrionic personality disorder, both being cluster B, are just different types of narcissist. And that with Beth, she has this grandiose sense of self-importance, that she thinks she's ultra-powerful, brilliant and beautiful. She regards herself as special and unique. It shows in the way that she behaves in front of other people, particularly her father. She operates with a huge sense of entitlement. She's interpersonally exploitative. She takes advantage of many other people to achieve her own ends. She has no emotional empathy. She's ha arrogant. She's haughty. But what we have is that many of those behaviours are wrapped up in a sexual nature with her. And therefore, whilst one would see that it would fit with histrionic, as I say, I regard that as just another flavour of narcissist. And she shows repeated sense of entitlement, no emotional empathy. She lacks accountability for her behaviours. She goes through the world believing that she can do as she pleases. She's grandiose. She's haughty. She has magical thinking. She shows lots of different manipulative behaviours. She doesn't give a shit about anybody. Her boundary recognition is non-existence. She goes where she wants, whenever she wants, does whatever she pleases. Furthermore, she shows lots of different aspects of the narcissistic dynamic. It's not hard to reach the conclusion, therefore, that she is a narcissist. But there's more than that. The impulsiveness that she demonstrates, the recklessness that she engages in, the fact that she clearly must fight against the presence of boredom, always seeking some form of stimulation. Those are indicative, along with the fact that she persistently disregards the rights of other people. She doesn't consist to social norms, witness her behaviour in the shop, witness her behaviour when she goes into meetings. She isn't polite to people. She goes in, sits on the desk, immediately starts insulting people and letting them know her plans for how she's going to ruin their company. She's aggressive. She lies repeatedly. She's irresponsible with regard to the way that she acts and she exhibits no fear. What is clear with Beth Dutton is that she's not just a narcissist. What is she then? Beth Dutton is a narcissistic psychopath. And in terms of her narcissist categorization, 
She is an upper lesser type B somatic. She is a bully. She's bold, belligerent, and boasts. She operates with no facade. She's intelligent. Upper lessers can be intelligent. But it has to be her way. She is like a bulldozer, a wrecking ball, that's always on this permanent war footing. I'm big, you're weak. I'm strong, you're pathetic. It has to be done my way. Layer that as well with the way that she utilizes sex so often that caters to her somaticism, and she likes to drink expensive drinks, be seen in expensive bars, that she drives a flash car, that she likes to bandy around the name Dutton to intimidate people. It's quite clear that she's an upper lesser type B somatic. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.